goes now. We are squawking dead. dead. A, a podcast, podcast pulverized against the of the, the walking dead, dead universe. universe. And I'm your host, David Cavio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined by Cosmob Zero and I, Rachel Burke, and Survivor's Tier member, Jasmine.iac on Instagram. Today we're covering the... 10th episode of season seven of fear of the walking dead titled morning cloak but before we continue and before we even do the ad spots i have a couple of things that i need to open to unbox on behalf of uh, everybody so the first easy one because it's right in front of me i got a little something from sharon d got a little Aww. card here little puppy right and inside is obviously a message yes yeah, so yeah. oh, uh, i'm like gonna this read puppy. oh yay we got puppies <laughs> So uh, it says, Dave, I just wanted to send you a little reminder of the amazing time we had at the con and to thank you for everything. Your friendship and acceptance and inclusion has changed my life for the better. So, so many incredible ways. Thank you. And I love you. Sharon D. Aww. Heart, heart with a pew. See? Yeah. <laughs> this is what she sent me. And it's, you probably got the same thing, I'm sure, right? I got a different one. You did? Why don't you show yours? Oh, you did get a different one. Is it? Is it focusing? Yeah, I, I think I can see. You can see that, right, uh, Jasmine? Yeah, there's you a shine. Sandy, Jenna, right, there's a shine on it. Eliza yeah. and silt it up Rachel. down. There you go. Oh yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, there we go. And this is what I got. Uh, let me see if you can see all of that. There it is. Okay. And I'm, uh, I, I've got to scroll through everybody. it because I know my video is going to be a vertical. So look at my two best is right here. That was our second family photo. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the better one, arguably. Look at look at me and Aiden. So there's Jenna. You there's and Aiden are so fucking adorable in that picture. Like I like you two are like the focus of that photo. I love it so much. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think he he even expected me to do that, too, <laughs> which makes it even better. And it's right here under my camera, right where it belongs. So far, so far, it'll change. Aww. It'll be on the wall somewhere. One of these walls right here where I can see it. Or I can keep my eye on it <laughs> and, and attack thieves for stealing it. Uh, so the second thing I'm going to open, it's a big box. So bear with me. I have a big box from Vanessa. They're all they're all named. And named. I, I'll open mine first. It's bubble wrapped. It looks like it's framed, whatever it is. I'm looking at the note that's in back of it. So this is like perfectly packed. So that it's right? not immediately revealed. So uh, it says, Dave, there are really no words to thank you for everything you've done for this little family. I know that in no way does this gift ever pay back your generosity. I don't think there's anything I could make that would repay it, but I hope you like it. Once again, thank you from the bottom of my hearts, hearts, it says hearts, from Aww. our hearts Aww. and the top of our roof. Vanessa, Oh. Magda. And Cherokee Rose, her dog. Okay, so I'm flipping it over. Aww. And it's a call. This is cool. <gasps> okay, so what it is, it's a clock. <gasps> oh, Can it's you a see clock. It? Oh, that's freaking awesome. That is Holy so cool. Holy shit. Yeah, so it has our logo on the front. That's fucking incredible. And it, the background's kind of like a bloody something or other. And it's got <gasps> Roman numerals for each of the times. And it's a clock with, with white hands and bloody, that a bloody background. It's so cool. Oh, it doesn't end there, folks, because this isn't just for me. But wait, there's more. This is great. <laughs> Sharon D gets one, too. And I haven't looked at it yet. So I, it, again, backside hey, up. Mate. This is Sharon D's note. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for everything you did in the charity show. There are no words to properly thank you, but I hope this little gift lets you know how much my mother and I are grateful for you and the rest mm. of the Rest of the two, 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 the rest of the two. So once again, thank you very much. <laughs> Vanessa Magda and Cherokee Rose. Now let's see what, what hers looks oh. like. Okay, so it's, it's oh, whoa, okay. It's essentially the same, but the, the numbers are gold. Oh. And, and Arabic numerals. And it's got black mm. cloth on instead of white. Uh, oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Rachel. Oh, wait, ah, ah, I'm so shocked. <laughs> this is you right now. Oh, I'm so because you're this hung is over. The, <laughs> this is this is my max energy right now. Like, if this were yesterday, I would be screaming. But like, this is all I can muster right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this is your 110 percent right now. It really is. <laughs> 
no reveal for me just yet. So it says, Rachel, there are very little ways I can say thank you for all you and the team did for my mom. But Ooh. that doesn't mean I won't try. <laughs> I know this is small, but hopefully it can show just how grateful we are to you. We are eternally grateful for your kindness and, and support. Support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vanessa Magda and Cherokee Rose. Yay. And I speak fluent cursive. It's okay. <laughs> and this is yours. Oh. Ooh, and your, those are your cool hands are gold. Hands. Ooh, those are cool. I'm so excited. Oh my god. That is so freaking cool. Yeah. That is so freaking cool. And each one is unique, too. I, yeah. Yeah. They're all a little different. I love it. I yeah, love let's it. Put, let's put everything back. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. This is awesome. We don't have anything like this. And I just moved into my place, so this is going to be perfect for our room here. Thank you, Vanessa. It is really wonderful. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, those were really, really incredible. Before we continue, we need to talk. We need to talk to you. We need to have a conversation about Phineas Coffee. Phineas Coffee is delicious coffee brewed with the highest quality standards. We drink it here in the Cameo House. I would never, ever sponsor something that I haven't tried myself and don't approve of. So Phineas Coffee is offering our fans, our listeners, our watchers, our family, 10% off their next order if they use the code Squawking Dead, no spaces at checkout. Or you can click the link undoubtedly in the description of this video if you're watching on YouTube or uh, just go to PhineasCoffee.com, P-H-I-N-E-A-S coffee.com and just use the code that I just said, Squawking Dead, no spaces. Do it now, you, you rap, rap scallion. You love coffee. Do I love coffee. Now. Just oh, get 10% off your next order. Coffee. Of course, you can always go to the merch store, squawkingdead.com, click the main menu at the top left and choose merch. If you happen to be a tier member at ko-fi.com slash squawkingdead, at least the Whisperers tier, if not the Survivors tier, you do get 50% off regularly priced merch. Just contact me and I will send you the form and you can get some merch. Before I continue with us talking about our feelings about this uh, episode, I'd like to play Sharon D's take discussing the actual title when the episode titles for the back half of Fear the Walking Dead seventh season appeared. Sharon D saw Morning Cloak as one of the episode titles and looked it up. And here's what we found. As she described it, February 18th, predicting what she thinks it means. Let's see how accurately she described what may what has happened throughout this episode. The first thing I want to talk about is actually the fear titles that were just released. Morning Cloak 710. So I looked up Morning Cloak because I thought maybe it had some kind of cultural significance or something like that. The return that came back was a butterfly. A butterfly is called the Morning Cloak because it's uh, got dark wings with a lighter colored edge. And it's supposed to resemble a young woman who is tired of mourning and is pulling up her dark skirts to show the bright colored petticoats underneath. It's supposed to, A, symbolize the loss of a loved one. Also... It's a very long-lived butterfly. They they hibernate over the winter. And so since they reappear in the spring, they are also seen as a sign of life. So they're a harbinger of death or the loss of a loved one, but they're also a sign of spring and the return to life. Maybe this is the episode where Madison comes back and Alicia's going to die. Just conjecture. So did, did I hear her say that uh, in her research, it said that this butterfly was long lived right it has a Did long I hear that life, right a long lifespan yeah which is contradictory to what we heard howard say i would say that con maybe it's in contrast to other butterflies plus the fact that this one happens to hibernate for winter and then come out again so maybe they all die out yeah i i, I don't know anything about butterflies so maybe a year is a really long lifespan if a normal lifespan is only a few months i guess yeah, i don't like know a season maybe yeah, I don't know anything about butterflies. I, I didn't even bother looking it up because I knew about this take. Mm -hmm. Butterflies typically live 15 to 29 days. Wow. Wow. That is a long time. Wow. Okay, that's, so yeah. So a year 12 is lifetimes, really uh, long in comparison. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay, fair enough. Now, I, I do want to interject here. You know, it's funny. Oftentimes I'll have notes, I'll have thoughts. I've heard this take before and then... It's not until like I'm sitting in front of you guys that I think of something else. And I just love that. But it occurs to me that like perhaps the obvious answer is that this is Charlie. But what if the morning cloak itself is really June? June has been in mourning. Remember what we said about what Alicia probably should do, as you said in the last episode in 709, is retreat into herself mm -hmm. and perhaps lick her wounds and 
build herself up again to just at least be a fighter. Well, June, ever since she lost John in many, many senses, she's retreated into herself. She's she's like, no, you can't go up there, John Dory Senior. No, you can't like in the, the bunker. No, you can't do this. Not. And she even says it in this episode, I've, I've retreated unto myself and, you know, knowing that this only hurts me. But now that's not the case anymore. She's lifting herself out of mourning and she's taking a more active role. Classic yeah, misdirect. That- Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, the first time I watched it, I thought more about June. And then the second time I watched it is when I was like, "Mm, maybe it's actually more relative to Charlie then. Relevant, you mean? I don't even want to talk about it, about Charlie being sick. My brain can't even... Baby steps. We'll we'll get there. Can't even comprehend that. But yeah, upon my second watch, I thought... Perhaps it is more about Charlie. More Charlie, yeah. Yeah. Listen... Rachel, we'll do a fireman carry and we'll we'll walk through this episode together, <laughs> arm in arm. Well, so crazy. Not too long ago, I didn't even like Charlie. <laughs> oh, this is like the Gabriel thing. This is I remember we talked about this, how like, oh, I hate that little bitch and like, at first. And then like slowly but surely you're like, eh, okay, I'm like she's all right. Well. She helped save Alicia that one time and damage on the inside. She kind of impressed, right? She kind of impressed me. She's- Help save a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, that little badass. Jasmine, what do you think about Charlie? First first impressions and then all the way through. I mean, I've, I've always liked Charlie, but I never liked any of the originals, so, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm glad I'm Nick's like, dead. I'm pro, I'm like, literally, when Nick died, I was like, yes. Okay. Wow. Can we, can we talk about that, actually? Wow. So what, is, what was it about Harsh. Nick that annoyed you? I just hated his, like, blase, you know, everything's fine attitude, I have plot armor, and then he died, and I was like, ha ah, finally. Apparently plot armor doesn't exist on Fear the Walking Dead, for right, most yeah, people. I mean, clearly. So, wow. yeah, I was pretty happy. I never liked Madison, I never liked Nick. The only original that I actually really liked was probably, like, Alicia. Probably then, like Alicia, right? Like, not even, like, eh, definitely. Like, 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 I, like Alicia grew on me after like, after maybe. her family died. Um, I like I liked her a bit before her family died, but she really came into her own after her family died. Right, clear to the field. Fair, right, Lance? I stopped liking Alicia more after I watched the One Hundred because, like, <laughs> see, see, <laughs> see. <laughs> see? Yeah. yeah. I, I like getting takes like this because it's not always obvious that like everybody liked Nick Clark. I mean, I've even heard other people's. Even I, like, okay, Nick Clark was to me like a lot of what people liked about Daryl Dixon. He's like, it's like mis- odd, mysterious, put things onto him that probably aren't earned, but in his own way, kind of badass, in his own way, walking between the, the raindrops most of the time. Plot armor, like you said. But, you know, there were things that annoyed me about him a lot, but he, yeah. I liked him a lot as well. So there's that. I don't know. Two, the two things can exist, I suppose. So speaking of June, I'm going to just go right into Sharon D's. So why not talk about the one thing that we kind of want to talk about is June, June's confrontation with Howard. But let's take, let's do Sharon D's take because it kind of goes from the beginning to the end on that. Guys, who doesn't like more Sharon D? And then like all our fans go, well, well, uh, no, I like Sharon D. So you shut the fuck up. All our fans like Sharon D. See, but I have to Everybody be the... likes Sharon D. See, but if I say, like, oh, there are people out there that don't like Sharon, so like, we can all step up again. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> if in, Just, just in case. Happen. Right. I mean, of course, I'm going to talk about June because not only is she my favorite character, of course, but her standing up to Howard was the high point of the episode. First of all, she, she kind of even said it herself. She's been hiding. When she stood up to Virginia, she ended up losing John. And she just feels like standing up to Strand and Howard right now is what what good would it do her? And until now, it hasn't hurt anybody, really, you know, except for all the fucking people they killed. But and, and herself, she really could have stopped Charlie from going if she'd really put her foot down and told Howard, no, you are not sending Charlie on this expedition to get elevator parts. It's not even like Charlie went to go get something important like uh, medical supplies or food or something. She went to go get fucking elevator parts so Strand could have elevators in his tower that's the stupidest reason to send anybody out and june could have stopped that and she knows she could have stopped that it's hurting charlie of course but it's also hurting june 
because Charlie is one of her last links to John. She and John took care of Charlie after 4A because Charlie was staying with them on the bus in, in 409, people like us. When the stadium fell and June went to stay with the Vultures, Charlie was there. So she's closer to probably Charlie than, than almost anybody else left on the show. That is kind of what really pushed her to finally stand up and say, you know what, I am not losing anybody else to the, your ego trip. Like Alicia said in the last episode, she was so overpowered by other voices that she couldn't find her own. Well, I mean, June has kind of been overpowered by everybody's voices, and I think she finally realized that not only does she have her own, but she can use it to benefit people even more than she has been. I think this is a big step forward for her in terms of finding her own voice and stepping out of everybody else's shadow and taking a stand for what she believes, because it's gonna cost her anyway. That's part of why I'm so excited. So excited about this scene. Love you guys. Love you too. <laughs> uh, I, I did want to say a couple things in reaction to this, because I agree with basically everything, but I'm tightening the screws a little bit on some of the things she said, which was like, I, I didn't like the word overpowered. Like, so like Alicia's being overpowered by voices. Like, I don't, I don't think it's overpowered. Maybe it's semantics. I don't know. But I think, you know, when there's so many strong voices in the room of strong people, like you often don't listen to yourself, let's say, or you don't, tr you don't need to, right? Like it's kind of something you said, Rachel, where it's like, uh, well, I didn't have to. And now I have the opportunity, but there's something else, else that she said. I don't think June was surrounded by powerful voices or overpowered voices or even strong voices. I think she surrounded herself by her, that inner voice that said retreat or like, let's lick our wounds or let's just try to live can we just try to live or it, kind of something like Sharon D has said classically from the start of season seven it's kind of like well what's wrong with that what's wrong with just living and being alive morgan what's wrong with strands <laughs> strands tower nothing you're you're right there, there's nothing wrong with living and trying to be alive however form that takes so i don't i don't think i don't agree or maybe she didn't maybe she i don't know it could be semantics also but like i think the voice inside her is herself saying no don't don't try for a power play. It's literally what June said in this episode. It's like, don't try for a power play. This, I'm, she's doing what Alicia's classically done. Is like, you don't have to listen to you. I know you're strong. I know you could run this thing. But nah, let's not try to do that, maybe a little. <laughs> I really liked the whole idea of her caring for Charlie. I, I also don't, I didn't 100% agree with the fact that like she cares for Charlie in terms of the bus thing. But I, when she said she was there with the vultures, I, I'm, I don't doubt that. She took, she, you know, she, they watched out for each other when they were traveling together. I don't doubt that at all. I think that's, that sounds right. Yeah, I, I agree with everything she said too. I'm nervous because of the comment June made about basically revealing her own plot armor, right? Like, I'm more important than you are, Howard. And that, like, just her saying that made me go, ooh, famous last word. Like, don't, like, just, yeah, like, eh. don't show them that you have a Kevlar <laughs> vest because then they'll shoot yeah. in your neck. Exactly. <laughs> It's just like a, a, watch like a, a doctor rock up to the tower the next day, like <laughs> right? Because as soon as, as as soon as there's someone more capable around, oh, or maybe like, she'll or maybe she'll pull uh, um the doctor at Grady doctor that Stephen. killed the other doctor oh, yeah. to stay to say to stay relevant to like make sure he was needed. He killed the other doctor or allowed oh, him to die. Do you remember at Grady Memorial? So. I don't know his name, but I do know that Tyler Phillip. You know Cox, who I'm talking about. Tyler Philip Cox actually interviewed the actor that played the doctor. The doctor, who got rid okay. Of, right. I think he got rid uh, of the other do doctor. Doctor Edwards. Edwards. Yes, that sounds right. Yeah, Doctor Edwards. Doctor Stephen Edwards. That sounds right. Yeah. So he killed a doctor or let a doctor die. Someone was dying. He was uh, the dying he, person he was a doctor, he and he he intentionally gave Beth, Beth the wrong meds. The me yeah. Uh, so that killed him, yeah. Right, because right. he needed to be the only doctor. So that scene kind of leapt into my head when June revealed her own plot armor, and I'm like, ooh, right. no, 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 no. Although what gives me a little <laughs> bit of hope, because, okay, what's always in the back of, I think, all of our minds is doctors in the apocalypse. Why is June mm -hmm. the exception? But why June is... Because she's a nurse. That's right. Sure, okay, She's a nurse, sure. not a doctor. But, you know, actually, so oh, wait a second. Hold on a second. Anybody who's had any medical training and has attempted to use it has typically been on the chopping block. You know, they're a doctor in the apocalypse. Enid, <laughs> uh, Denise was a nurse. Denise. 
But she no, was Denise, a med student. She said Denise was a resident graduated from medical school. Okay, but she wasn't. But she wasn't a resident. She chose to pursue psychiatry. S- psychiatry. Okay. Mm-hmm. And well, it's funny about that is like why she's perfect for Tara is because Tara graduated, I think, the the police academy, and then she was about to take a beat, and then the apocalypse happened. So they're, they're like they're right. perfect. And, and then, like, and then right she's like the too afraid to careers. be. Yeah, exactly. But what gives me hope is are things like what's starting to happen, which is guys like, okay, and, and look, the, the jury's not out, but guys like Tomi, Tomichi Okamura on The Walking mm-hmm. Dead, the moment doctors, and maybe we're starting to see a pattern, the moment doctors or people with medical training start to be more than just the doctor is when maybe they get to survive because they're not limited by what they do. Or they're not tied down by what they do. Tommy is now kind of venturing into this whole, well, it's not just about what I do. It's about who I'm taking care of or like who I choose to take care of or or how I'm going to exist in this world. Maybe he takes up a more of an active role in a sort of resistance. And June is typically, I think, the reason why she still survives is that she it's not just about her medical training. She gets in the fight. You know, she she shoots, she jumps, she dives, she does. She helps where she can't. Now, June's so. a whole character who just happens to be medically doc- trained. Right. Yeah. It, she's right, not medically a doctor trained. who can, she's not a medical professional who can do other things. She's her own thing who just happens to know some medical stuff. Right. But in the tower, which is why I was more wor- worried for her in the tower, mm-hmm. she was the, the doctor. She And what validates my concern originally, why she's like, okay, why are you in Stern's tower? What? Him, huh? you're, you're just going to be the doctor. Nobody gives a shit about you anymore. <laughs> Is that when you are the doctor, you are, you, your plot armor weakens as a doctor. Mm-hmm. It's like minus 10 <laughs> on the possible cho- chopping block. Oh. I am sorry. That's why I was, but, I, maybe I didn't articulate it at the time, but that's what I felt <laughs> as yeah. well. But Sharon, he just shared with us the, the meaning behind the morning cloak is a woman pulling herself out of mourning and revealing these hopeful rays, you know? So, and I think that's colorful. What, yeah. June, I think said out loud that she's going to start doing that. So I'm hoping in the next episode or, or soon here, we see her doing that. You know, Pulling up taking a more skirt? active role. <laughs> I mean, maybe no. <laughs> whatever it takes, whatever. It t- oh, sorry. Well, I mean, we saw her stand up to Howard, so maybe we'll see some more of that. Maybe when Strand yeah. gets back, she'll tell him what for too. Which, which does so. s- still concern me too. I mean, like, it's not just enough to be a doctor and be concerned that, like, okay, doctors in the apocalypse, but like, probably kind of like the way it concerns you about Alicia. Okay, okay you're gonna try this again. Mm. There's no guarantees. But I think that's what I always liked about June anyway. The same reason why I liked Alicia is that you look with the information that you have, you are going to try the, to do the right thing. And I, I applaud that. I applaud anybody that can move past their hangups and become something more than what's expected of them or more, what maybe even what we expect from them. No, no, Alicia, <laughs> just get some rest. And da, 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 like, No, I get it. Okay. If you want to be more, nobody's going to stop you. But like the moment that Charlie does it in this episode... You know, we're like, okay, I don't know about a child, a child getting elevator. But I don't know if that's the best skill set. To re- it's not worth, is it worth the risk? Is it worth the risk? And yet our group always did that to her. Between the propeller parts and the hangar where Daniel Salazar Daniel. was in, knowing full well that Victor and he'd have a checkered past, etc. So, which may come up again. I don't know. I want to kind of go through what you think is going through Victor's mind or general sense when it comes to keeping this these jars of butterflies on the shelf. This is something I struggled with at first until I watched this episode a couple more times. Honestly, I have I really don't know what the man's thinking. I mean, I liked the story that Howard told about how the cat or the uh, butterfly starts at what as one thing and then changes into something else and so it could it be just as simple as strand relates to these insects because they were one thing and then turned into something else. Could it be that simple? I don't know. Like vanity, essentially. Yeah. Like, oh, be yeah. like me. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I became something bigger than I than I was yeah. assumed to be, let's say. People yeah. saw I mean, you me could as... Argue, you could argue that a caterpillar is, you know, ugly in comparison to the butterfly. So maybe Strand sees himself as transforming into something more beautiful. What he is now, he likes more than what he was. The butterflies kind of threw me off a bit. But all I could really gather was it was some kind of way of testing people. Mm, that that okay. valid valid J- just like, the way will they to go out people. and do something so trivial Stupid. for me <laughs> so dumb yeah, yeah. i mean if, yeah and like if as do, in, okay. like, if, 
If, if they're like going to do something stupid for me, one, they must be capable of being out in the world, and two, they kind of must have blind faith in me to go... Mm. Loyalty, testing loyalty. Yeah. And, and it could be that... Mm. <laughs> oh, God, I can't. I'm going to say this because it makes me look stupid. It could be that Howard himself is like the Dave on Squawking Dead. He's a tribute. He's attributing things to capturing the butterflies that isn't really there. Like, <laughs> meaning Victor is just doing it as a test, as a hazing, as John Dory sort of articulated. But Howard yeah. is saying, no, 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 this is significant. There's always a significance behind what the writers say. So <laughs> Howard is Dave. <laughs> Let's establish that. Okay. I, I mean, That's I'm sure funny. Howard's like in on yeah. it too, but he's just like, he's got to pretend, you know? It's like uh, what they said when they arrived in the Commonwealth, what um, Yumiko said to the other people, you're just pretending that you're useful so that nobody notices that you're not. <laughs> That's basically Howard in the in the tower. Like, he's not really useful. He just has to play a part and pretend he's yeah. useful. So that Strand keeps him around. He basically enforces what Strand wants, and that's about it. Strand's yeah. will, right. Well, I think yeah. that's like everybody, he, though, right? It's not just yeah, Howard. He did, he did, like, Howard doesn't have any, like, particularly useful skills other than a bit of bureaucracy. Like, he's not, like, a survivor. He's not, like, a fighter or anything, you know? I'm I'm waiting to find out that Howard has actually been manipulating Strand for far longer than we even realize. I have a feeling that Howard is more influential than we see. Otherwise, I'm going to be really disappointed in the character, to be honest, because I'm really liking Howard as a bad guy, but I want him to be worse. I want him to be so much worse than he is. Right, because it's not fair that we just, <laughs> well, the bad guys to be bad and good guys to be good thing that you like so yeah. much. We, I mean, look, yeah. we are always lacking that in the Walking Dead universe in more yeah. in, in many respects. Like, nobody goes full tilt. You have your occasional alphas and governors, and it, but Negan, they kind of dialed back. I mean, oh, he's understandably bad. <laughs> But yeah. I, I, I actually don't. I kind of like Howard the way he is. And I hope that he's more acting out of faith, like this kind of In faith strand. driven. Because if because if and when maybe that faith breaks, ooh, let's see what happens to Howard now. I want to see what, mm. because there, there's some indications that that may be the case, because something that happened inside the episode with uh, Ian Goldberg, he kind of says, we may see soon glimmers Howard's of past. his past. That, that influence why he is the way he is with Victor in the present, let's say. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, the way he, and this weird relationship he had with the Ali. How cool would it be if we, we've been hating Strand. Well, a lot of people have been hating Strand because he's the I bad see. guy, right? I see. But then yeah. we find out Strand's not really all that bad. It's Howard we should have been looking at the whole time. Like, or I like think Howard's that would been be poisoning cool... his mind or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think that would be a cool reveal to find out Howard's actually worse than Strand. Or on the flip side, like you were saying, maybe uh, Howard's faith in Strand gets shook. And so now Howard's like, oh, man, I need to take this guy out. And maybe he has a hand in taking Strand out. And this is why I like this, that, that latter scenario more, because the audience, well, I don't know about the audience, maybe just the audience of one, Dave, <laughs> you, you get this sympathetic character and you struggle whether or not like you want him to go because he has this epiphany and then you want him to turn to june and and go hey can we talk can we can we work something out because i've been following a, a genuine lunatic this whole time <laughs> and, right and i don't know what to do here and and like the audience has to decide whether or not they actually like or sympathize with they won't it's me it's just me <laughs> i think it's just me uh sympathizes without it because i do i i saw glimmers Right, like this weird relationship with Ali where for the most mm -hmm. part he does test him. He does maybe like a father to son or a strict father to son test his son. I'm, I'm saying using son in quotes to, to make a man out of him, to, to learn to be self-sufficient, to learn to, to, to live in this harsh world to, and, and maybe take the lessons that Victor's imparting on him like a man of faith mm -hmm. in a way. Or, or yeah, that's funny because right before the episode, they did flash back to when Victor first meets Howard and he has the same... Christopher Medallion Christopher of his own. Medallion. Mm -hmm. And he was never really a man of faith, right? His it was his wife. wife. Was. And yet he's finding faith in Victor, which is ironic because he was never really that kind of person, which maybe, kinda, kinda, maybe he has faith in Victor or he's the I one see. doing the manipulating. That's right. my theory is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, it, 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 I'll tell you, it would blindside me. Even you saying that it would right. just based on what we're seeing of, mm -hmm. of him now, I, I guess. I, I don't, Cause you and me both have said like, okay, what if, what is how it's the big bad, right? Like, it, mm -hmm. but as, as this season kind of progresses and is as forceful as his voice is. And I, I don't agree with Jasmine necessarily because I could say this while she's out 
I don't think he's a man of limited skill sets. He has knowledge. He has knowledge of history, dipl- diplomacy, law, bureaucracy, sure, to run the tower. He runs the tower, arguably. He's survived this long, too, so he's doing something right. We can say right. that, at least. It's not all luck, right? It's, I mean, it is luck, but it's not all luck. Yeah. It can't be. Right, right. He's doing something right. Oh, I will say before Jasmine gets back, I wouldn't be surprised if we find out that Howard had a son, and that's why he is the way he is towards Ali. And or a daughter, let's say. Mm-hmm. Or he was trying to have kids but never could. Or, and there's always this yeah. kind of like, I always wanted one, and here he is. You know, that sort of, mm. <laughs> sort of thing, maybe. Okay, fair. So like, fair which would yeah. explain things a little bit more, because like, I've always wanted to be a parent, but I've never been a parent, so this is how I treat my kid. <laughs> like rubbish. <laughs> Because Howard, he looks like me without saying, oh, well, obviously Ali is of Muslim faith. He was, his father was an imam in the army or the rangers. Mm-hmm. Well, the army rangers is what it is, right? So the question I wanted to ask you guys is where do you think Strand is? What do you think this scouting mission is? Is he spying on Morgan? What do you think he's doing? Well, I wrote down initially, which was true, was that he was on a scouting mission to get the elevator parts. That was initially true. You he really and, think Strand himself would go out for that, though, and not just send a team of people? Answer is like, no, I don't. Like he did, yeah. <laughs> I just know that Garcia, who we meet in the beginning of the episode, went ahead to mm-hmm. meet up with Strand initially in the, as part of the scouting team. So I assume that he was scouting mm-hmm. for elevator parts and then went on to do something else. And that the something else mm-hmm. thing, I don't know what is. Okay. Whatever, wherever he is now, he's staying overnight and not bothering to come back. This is where the evil Howard comes in. Could be maybe yeah. like, oh, I sent him away and he's dead or something. Supposed to be at least. Yeah. I'm guessing whatever mission Strand is doing now was always the primary objective. I just don't see him going out to obtain elevator parts himself. You know what? I, I forgot to say what I thought the butterflies were. Oh, yeah. Because I, I had an idea. It suddenly kind of occurred to me that, like, it's one thing to say, I want all my people to evolve and become more than just who they are, or become beautiful, or become beautiful just like me, which oh, obviously I'd thought of. Like, I, I obviously thought, okay, I want you to evolve. I want you to be the, the next stage in your development, according to me. But then <laughs> why, keep, why keep them in glass jars? But then what is that if not what Strand is doing in the tower? I want you to evolve, but evolve according to what I want you to evolve into. I want you to stay just the way. I want you to, to maintain what you wanted to do pre-apocalypse even. So I don't want you to be the person you were meant to be in the TW universe or something like that. I want you to be what, you know, what you wanted to be before, you know? So you wanted to be a badminton player? Okay, be a badminton player in the tower. Because I'm going to give you everything that you wanted originally. The only thing I ask for is loyalty here. Uh, uh, just be that way here. Don't be the person you were meant to be. If you were a doctor, be a doctor. If you're... I say this because I think Strand wants Ali Muhammad to be the ranger he wants to be. I think he just wants him to fight for it. You know, I, I think he wants him to kind of go through something first to make, to feel that metamorphosis and then just be the thing he always wanted to be. But what Ali was meant to be was a freedom fighter, essentially. Like he, he, he was meant to help. Okay. So the way I wanted to answer this was what he was meant to be was probably something that my brother and I had talked about recently. Prior to doing this podcast, I, I was heavily into the dream of being a singer songwriter. I plugged away at it almost like at least a couple times a week in dive bars, getting slots at 11 p.m. on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, coming home at 2 a.m., eating large slices of pizza on the way home because I'm famished and I'm tired. I'm, I'm doing plugging away at this dream and not thinking of other things. I'm so focused on the dream, I'm not thinking of what it must be to be a well-rounded person and live life. So I, I identified with Ali in that respect and that like I, I'll maybe if I become that thing, I, it can absolve mistakes in the past or it can like having abandoned my father uh, on his deathbed radiation which also by the way mirrors paul and his and rowan in a sense like there's little symmetry Mm. between ali and paul in that respect except he chose to leave his father on his deathbed paul didn't have a choice but going back to me i was too obsessed with the dream to to be involved with a, a loved one or i was kind of fooling myself like while i'm who has time to date or live a better life, find a better apartment, drive a better car if you're just so obsessed with your dream? And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But when you are obsessive about it and that's your life and that's all you do, you kind of miss out on friends. You kind of miss out on a possible significant other. Just life in general, like shows, uh, going out with friends, having dinner, having casual conversation, things like that. And so when Ali figures out, I don't need to be this thing that I always thought I wanted to be to absolve myself of a sin that I committed prior, like I could just live. And maybe that's kind of like going back to Morgan's message at the end of season five, just live. Maybe that's what it's about. It's about living. You know, it's about doing more than just what is ex expected of me of what is owed to me or what I, what, I, what I wanted to do to absolve myself of things. So when I was talking to my brother about this, I was like, yeah, I was kind of, I had blinders on. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to experience all of life. I don't want you to just obsess over one thing because that is going to make you blinded to other opportunities that are just sitting there waiting for you to pluck them like a rose mm -hmm. or have them land on you like a butterfly, you know, <laughs> you know, if you don't stick your finger out, nobody's going to land on it. So I loved the scene where Ali finds the butterfly and captures the butterfly and kills a walker all in one swipe. I'm like, oh, that was. And he uses gotcha. Cool. And then he says, very gotcha. Uh -huh. It was like, it's kind of funny to yeah. see that. He yeah. used the same and words. It was, and it was really pretty too. Like even with the walker, like the whole, the scenery was just really beautiful. Oh, wait. So going back to Victor. Yeah, I, th I think his intention was to bottle these people, all the people okay. in the tower, mm -hmm. according to his vision. Which but he's the, doing, basically. Yeah, exactly. But when Ali sets them all free, that's which is what is supposed to be, what's supposed to happen. It signifies his, his ability to move further beyond what was expected to him. Arguably not be Strand's caterpillar, but be his own butterfly. Let's say. Were there some jars of butterflies like hidden in another room? Because it seemed like there was a lot more <laughs> butterflies in that room than there were in the jars. Artistic license. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say this. It's, it probably wasn't, but like they filled it out because that's how it felt to Charlie. Aw, maybe we were just seeing what Charlie saw. Aww. I found myself emotional two times in this episode. And one of them was that. I was like, first of all, finding out that she has a death, like has the weight of mortality hanging above her. And then, but coupled with Ali giving her that gift, that, that was really heart rendering. But I found myself feeling for Howard at one key moment. And that was, that was when he was holding Ali and he was almost mm. mad at himself. Like, I'm sorry, son. Like, I think what he literally Victor says, I'm do. sorry, son. He does. He said, I'm sorry, but this is what Victor would do. And the, the pain on his Turning face himself is off. so clear. Mm -hmm. Right. Resigning his own what he thinks is right and wrong for Victor's will. With, again, more evidence mm. to me that he's a man of following. faith in he's this following, scenario. following, not leading. Yeah. And I hate feeling for him, too, because first of all, I know that everybody's going to hate me for feeling for him. <laughs> so there's, there's I, don't, that. I mean, I don't I don't feel not for you him, guys. but I saw. Yeah, I don't feel for Howard, but I did see the turmoil on his face when he was yeah. holding Ali too. Yeah, I don't think it would have been his choice, but he said, "This is this is what Victor would do, so this is what I have to do." All right, because it was so confrontational. Like, it's not often that you do see. Like, maybe to go back to him not being capable or have no skills. First of all, he went toe to toe with a teenager. For so <laughs> who who to, I mean, I assume has had some ranger training. First of all, a fifteen year old with like a arguably. 45 to 50 possibly <laughs> so like that's that's a no that's no content he and and one-on-one -on -one, hand to hand i think howard's got something on him <laughs> like or at least has some skills you know he's, that he was able to do that yeah so i think we have to and admit he had two that. two gunmen right there that could have just shot ali but he's like no 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 i'll t i'll handle it and maybe he would have like and oh, now this is occurring to me like maybe there's a part of him that says if this is how it's going to end for me and it won't and it didn't. But like, if this is how it ends for me, fine. I'd rather not have to kill him. But I know he would give his all like meaning, of course, he's going to try to take down Ali. Oh, and it occurred to me, by the way, that Ali might have even some boxing training too because of his father, like how much he loved boxing because he, he kind of went for like straight for like a like a gut punch or like a, a punch the bread box uh, on Howard and he did double over. But anyway, so what I was saying was I, I kind of thought like in that one instance, like, no, no, no. If this, if he's going to take me down, first of all, you're going to kill him anyway. But like, if, if this is how I'm going to go, I'd rather not, I'd rather go than have to kill a kid in, in a sense. Like, I don't want to have to do what I have to do for Victor in a sense. Does that but make sense? Did. But he did. Right. But and that's did. the thing. Yeah. That's the thing. I don't I think, think he that's would've... giving Howard just a little yes. too much credit. That's, I told you already. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, That's what I, I, I mean, I was I'm not quite that far. Like I, I did see this way on him 
But that's that's as far as I'll go for Howard. <laughs> you know, he still did it. He I'm gonna go a little thing. I'm gonna go a little further. Okay, just one inch, a little inch further. <laughs> when just after Howard and June spar, he was coming at me first. You know, I had to defend myself, etc. Mm -hmm. And I still felt for him, even when he said that. Like he's like he's saying the thing to convince himself that forget that. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> when John Dory Senior comes up behind him and says. June, you have to like you have to listen to him, etc. Like he's right, he's right. Like I was there, etc. You have to look at Howard's face. He's like, what? <laughs> I'm right. What? For, first of all, it's because it's coming from John Dory Senior. Because mm -hmm. he's kind of like a straight arrow. He's kind of like a no bullshit guy. If he if something feels wrong, he's gonna tell you, right? But then when he defends him, he's kind of like, what? <laughs> he's genuinely <laughs> surprised. Which is, by the way. Kudos to Omar Abtahi that I could see that. So even he's like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was defending myself. Like, oh, this is a surprise coming from you. So I, I kind of like that touch in that, in that one moment. Where do you think Strand has been, at least for this episode? I've got no idea, but to throw like a random shot in the dark. That's all we do. A, maybe he's got a lead on Padre. Oh, oh God. Okay. Do you That's... think he's looking for Padre? Last time he talked about it, he thought it was made up. Maybe just to, like, spite Alicia, you know? Or to, like, Fair. remove all hope, possibly. Yeah. Like, uh, if it is real, I, do, I don't want them to ever find it kind of situation. If it is real, he'd destroy it, right? So that his tower's the only viable option. Meanwhile, if he finds it, it helps others find it. So it's the classic villain, like, yeah. let me tell you my plan. <laughs> what? No, don't, that's fine. Don't tell me your plan. Oh, you don't know how to villain. I I do hope Padre is something real. I hope we find out it is a real place or thing or something. Cause, ugh. well, if it is, it's similar to the. Well, not similar, but like in the same vein as the Commonwealth, a, a not a secret government organization, but like an offshoot of somebody who was in government, uh, which is Pre President William Milton, decided to create this place with an ideology through the annals of some sort of form of system, create a society, right? So this would be somewhat similar. It literally had documents that made no sense <laughs> when we looked at them, but it is a government program meant to shelter people in the event of a massive disaster. So obviously it's run, well, I don't know about obviously, it was meant to be run by government officials, military possibly, etc. I could conceivably see somebody from government taking it over and then it being actually real, but whether or not they adhere to Padre's documents and procedures and I, who knows? Who imagine, knows? If, imagine if Padre is actually the Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Like a code name, right? Mm -hmm. There's no C in Padre. Oh, no, maybe like, like when it was originally like set up, it was Padre. And then once they built it up, they were like, we're going to call this place the Commonwealth. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There is a little bit of a callback when Ali's telling her the channel on the radio. He says it's channel four, <laughs> like the like the episode <laughs> with the same name. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of highlights from that episode to see what he may be talking, whether what the feeling that you're supposed to get from that is obviously is it's the first appearance of Wes and Tess, which rhyme. It's the same episode that has the documentary style with the landmines and everything like that. Alicia stops killing walkers. So there's that. But the overall idea of the episode was it started out one way, which is, you know, we want to help others. We want to, we just want to help others. And by the end of the episode is something that we learned was helping others helps ourselves, the brokenness in ourselves. And what if not Ali doing what he did was a way of fixing something that he felt was broken in him from leaving his father to making right what was once wrong with Charlie feeling like she needs to grow up and he gives that to her. So I thought that was, it's kind of a little cool tie in channel four. Did you guys notice that? Honestly, I, I didn't even catch it. Were so. you so upset with this episode that you didn't, you didn't catch it? I, I, I don't know if upset's the right word. It was cringeworthy, this episode. Let's transition to that. Cause I know yeah. we talked about that right before we went on. What in your estimation or your feelings makes you feel cringe? about this episode <laughs> it's obviously like the end of the episode where they were all like uh, it was a bit cringy but um, <laughs> where they're like uh, yeah but okay. I, like, I even look at like the bowling scene and i'm just like this is so like cliche and dumb and their children don't want to see this <laughs> why yes because they're children no no, no, no. i want to talk to the child first <laughs> <laughs> to the child <laughs> 
I'm kidding. She's hardly a child. I know you're an adult, but barely. <laughs> you're you're to to put a fine point on it. You're like only a few older than what Ali is supposed to be. Also, also to be honest, <laughs> I wouldn't want to see people my own age getting together. So let's but let's talk about that. Why 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 does it why is it cringe? Is it possibly that they're reducing what normally goes on your age, or is that some behavior among people your age and younger that it just it's you're embarrassed for them? I'm not embarrassed sense. for them. I just don't want to see it. But what is it about it that, that you don't want to see? Like, is it just, it's are you cringy. embarrassing yourself or is this a private no, no, moment? it's nothing to do with me. It's just like, it, 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 You know it's it has like, something ew. to do with you. It's like, it's like if, you're, it's like if your it's parents like, were to kiss in front of you, which like has never happened to me, luckily. But like, it's just like, ew, I don't want to see that. Right. So, so maybe this is more of like, you, you hate PDA, they, is essential, just in, in general. I mean, amongst children, yeah. <laughs> and your parents. <laughs> well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I kind of want to dig further, but I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna let you pause on that. I mean, it, it, every, every, time John and, every time John and June kiss, I'm like, yay! But, like, children, it's like, no, thank <laughs> you. Well, so what's the difference, in a sense? Like, what, what is, it, is it? It's not just that they're children. It's because you said your parents, too. It's the same reason. Is it, is it that no, maybe you're... I, meant, I didn't mean I didn't mean like I did like actively dislike the idea of my parents, but it's like no, like no. I'm trying to describe like the feeling for like the audience. I'm just like, ooh, I don't want to see that. I thought it was kind of sweet. Like I'm obviously not like in love with it. Or... I completely agree. I that was the cringiness for me as well. Just the the fact that they made a point to remind us of Charlie's age. And then mm -hmm. put her in these awkwardly romantic situations, which which I'm I'm also going to say, one, I think Charlie does deserve this. I think it's nice that she found this connection, but I don't want to see it. <laughs> Fair? It is, no, I'm just curious. I just what I like to poke people on is why is is it because it's it, she's too young because, and I shouldn't have to yes. see that or it's because I'm an adult and I should not be watching children kiss. That is inappropriate for me as an adult to watch children kiss. I didn't like the way it made me feel. So I went, ooh. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I can get you. I Fair. <laughs> this, this one I can't, I, I'm still trying to figure her out. Like you, I, okay, that's a perfectly rational explanation. She's 12. Thir 13. But she's Going actually, on 13. Isn't she actually, f she just turned 15? Alexa's yeah, 15. Like 15. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think Alexa I'll, I'll, just turned fifteen. I think the actor who played well, she'll Ali. She'll be actually she'll be sixteen in a couple of months. There's yeah, a, so there's actor, a, birthdays in June. Actor that plays Ali is nineteen. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Yeah, so that Whoa. actually that actually really? caused a, yeah. That's even worse. So that actually Ooh. caused <laughs> that actually caused a bit of a furore in on Twitter <gasps> that I, I caught out of the corner of my eye, but I was trying not to attribute any spoilers to it because I hadn't seen the episode yet, mm. or maybe I had. I don't remember. But yeah, people were really upset about the fact that like uh, the guy who plays Ali was 19 at the time and she was 15, I think, at the time that, that was filmed, mm -hmm. which, OK, like it's well, first... maybe even 14. Right. Depending on when it was filmed. When exactly. Depending right. on when they filmed. Yeah. So I but I'm more of like the, so I have always had like more of a European style thinking of, of these sort of things. But I know you think you're European, Jasmine. You're not. It's... <laughs> Excuse me. My father would always go to Europe and we always had like European influences in the house and we'd watch typically like European programs and listen to French music and, and stuff like that. So like we always growing up, we generally had like more of a European mindset, essentially, because he's always getting styles and samples from the from Europe and stuff like that. So there's always that influence. And while they were living in Syria, this is under the French occupation also. So there was a lot of that French language. My grandmother was a French teacher in Damascus. So there's always been that influence in our family. So like, obviously I'm just like you, Rachel. Like I obviously, and it's worse for me because I'm a guy and we have, to say guy. The, we have to say the quiet yeah. part out loud. Uh, obviously I'm scrolling through my feed. I look at Alexa nice and pictures. I'm like, if I like this, is this weird? <laughs> so, and sometimes I won't. Even it's if, a look, dilemma. You want to show support, but you don't want to cross that creepy line either. God, so, like uh, even yeah. like I wait till they're 30 before I can feel comfortable <laughs> <laughs> like cuz then I'm a, a little... 40 year I'm a 40 year old guy liking a 25 year old's pictures I'm like that doesn't feel right but that's less that's less creepy that's but, that's 
appropriate yes. at least. They're Obviously less creepy, but it still feels creepy to me. And it's and I acknowledge uh, the feeling I get when I when that when fair. I eventually do because she's twenty whatever. Like, and I'm not a creepazoid. That's what I want to hone in on is that I know that I'm not a creepazoid when I do like a picture from Alexa Nysenson. Here's how I know, because there are so many other people that do often repost oh. like photos. Right, right. And mm-hmm, so I, mm-hmm. there, but the choice of photos also sometimes are a little on the, and it's them, they post them publicly. So that's, but then putting them all together, it says, has, is, that's a statement. So then I don't like that. <laughs> Right. So, but, but going back to the kissing scene. So this is why I feel a little bit better because like, I know I'm not a creepazoid. I know that within the context of the story and I'm lo- the way I'm looking at the way it's being framed, it's not like sexual. It's not, it's, there's a sweetness no. to it. And so mm-hmm. when I see a scene like that, and I, I know, I know, but like, listen, when you grow up watching 90210 with your parents, <laughs> both flanking you left and right. And you look, I was a teenager once and I had to live through that. I'm out of that that period right now. I, I can feel a little bit better knowing that I can now sit with my parents watching a kissing scene or something else and be like, Hey, you like that? That's your son's watching that with you. And like, so like, then I can be like, now it's like, now I could fire back and go, yeah, that's revenge for all the feelings you didn't try to make me feel. <laughs> my point is, I guess I didn't feel that way anymore. I didn't, I don't, I don't generally feel that way anymore. Just with all the European influence, all, the, all that stuff. You go to a, a fucking beach in France and everybody's titties are out. So, like when you're, I'm like literally like a 14 but, year old. Oh, oh, okay. Watching other say, 14 year old girls. Right? No, no, no. Watching other 14 year old yeah. girls with their, with their titties out. Well, I, there's well, no. Now, now I feel guilty <laughs> saying that. Well, I was 14 well, at no, the time, no, no. people. When you go, I mean, I've, I've not traveled to other countries, but from what I've heard, when you go to other countries, they don't stigmatize nudity the way right. Americans do. Which is my point. We Americans have made nudity dirty and bad. Like, but everywhere else, it's it's embraced as you know beautiful body form, and and it's um, or it's just normal. It's just praised. part of the culture. It's not. Yeah. You know, you don't sh- look away from nudity. You say, oh, that's beautiful, and that's normal, even for like you, like fourteen year olds, I guess. I, well, especially as a I child. Wrong? <laughs> no, 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 especially as a, uh, Sherry says Americans yeah. Yeah. dot, 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 sex is bad, but violence is just fine. Well, uh-huh. I guess as, as a kid, you get, you normalize really quick. You can only look away so many times where you, until you just like, oh, it's just nipples. It's just, the, the, and there are other girls of various sizes that are of your age that you're like, okay, well, this is okay. This is the way it is here. So deal with it, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I did, and I'd have conversations See, too. That's, so like, that's it was fun. What- that's not why I think it's cringe. No. I just think... I don't think it's that per se. I just right. think I don't want to watch a child's romantic relationship unfold in front of me. Wait, but now you're saying romantic relationship, not yeah. not like, the act of kissing. Well, I really want to figure not, this out. I'm not, so sorry. For Is me, this bad? it's not necessarily the act of kissing. It's everything from the bowling scene to the interactions that just cliche. Yes. Like... Ugh. There's something about like the setup, right? That is too yeah, cliched. It's, like, it's, such, it's such a full <laughs> setup, and it's like. Let ugh. me show you how to play pool. Like you put your hand here, and then I hug you there. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, and now we're embracing. Oh, there's something going on in my pippity pants. Whatever. They never show that on TV, but you know it's happening. That's what I was thinking at the time. First of all, I don't want to think about a child's <laughs> erection. However, I know that he's 19, so it's okay. You just did. <laughs> But then again, I remember that I was 19 and I remember that that happened. And so let's just say the quiet part out loud because I can. I'm not, I didn't pop into 40. OK, I didn't pop into my 40s. I grew up. I was once a caterpillar. OK, and, wait, wait, wait. and then I just, always, have you not always been in that box? No, no. I had to climb into the box after 40 and be this <laughs> asshole that you see in front of me now. No, I just became a bigger caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> but it was once a small caterpillar. Yeah, there's a joke there that we that oh did we go too far? At what point were you the hungry caterpillar, <laughs> uh, or was, were you a thirsty caterpillar? Uh, uh, this this big <laughs> <laughs> for the audio podcast. You're, it's pretty small. <laughs> you're a thirsty caterpillar. <laughs> I was. So what? And I was a charming caterpillar. And we'll end it there because I feel like Jasmine's like oh now he's going to talk about his teenage love life. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, which we know Jasmine gets cringy about. So let's not go there. Let's not go there. No. If I can make an attempt at trying to figure this out, 
first of all, there's obviously like I get it. That I get the the obvious setup of the bowling. Show me how to bowl, please. Can do you want to build a snowman? No. Do you want to bowl? And then the the motions and showing her the hand placements and the tilt of the thing. So obviously, yeah, that's cringe. I get it. That's cringe. It's like obviously weird and awkward. Awkward. It was awkward un- is the better it was word. Unnatural. Unnatural. I mean, it's, it's natural. Like, it felt forced. I think even as a kid, you figure out: is this really happening? Right. Like, is, this, is this really happening? Am I getting close to a girl in the apo- first of all, in the apocalypse? There's that. <laughs> but then, just, you know, what's happening. And I think he does. And he's like, I, let me indulge for just a second, for just a sec. It's not nothing is going to happen. And then something does happen. And he's like, oh, <laughs> oh, this is what this could be like. But maybe in an attempt to try to figure out why this is so cringe, maybe it is because it's uh, uncanny va- valley, un- uh, uncomfortable. Like, is that's not how real life looks like. Or, or maybe this is something best kept private or something like that especially when especially when they're so young right we get to peek into what normally isn't shown and there's yeah that's it's a little strange and weird and even when you're a kid it's it, things happen like i was saying before and, and that's you don't want to show that on tv so, so i think whatever. i was okay i was i think i was pretty much okay with all of the interactions just the just just watching kids kiss made me feel yucky i felt like i needed to cover my eyes like i shouldn't be watching that oh i i got you i was, I was trying to figure out jasmine for a second um, I'm, the re- I'm the reverse of rachel in this situation like i don't care if they kiss but everything else was cringy now do, was oh, it cringy really? for you because it it wasn't believable or was it yeah, just difficult to watch it wasn't that it was not believable it just felt so forced okay so so a writing issue i don't like think the it's writers much writing. Were trying to force this this relationship I mean, I don't, I, I, I never like the idea of, of like a relationship being forced into a singular episode, except Laura, because it was the perfect episode. Now that I get. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, and then okay. but Laura even happened over a span of time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like it was a bit more. To that it wasn't a, whole, a day. I never, I never yeah. liked the idea of them just like shoehorning like a whole development of a relationship into one, into one episode. I'm going to agree with you because when we see Charlie and Ali finally get to the elevator and Charlie finally discloses what Morgan, what she's there to do, my brain went absolutely insane. Like I, my brain broke. I, my brain absolutely broke. And I'm like, first of all, I'm like, Charlie, you are so much smarter than this. Why are you telling him anything? And then I went, maybe she's lying. And then I went, but no, she really feels a connection. So of course she's going to open up to, but then, but she's smarter than that. Why are you, do, you, what? Uh, and then right. I broke. And then, and then you remember that, she, then you remember <laughs> she's like, oh, I'm turning 13. She's or, 12. Yeah. She's 12 years then old. And you remember she's 12. Yeah. That's what, that's what clicked for me. It was like, oh, all of these things, all these feelings are coming, kind of coming up really hard right now. And she's getting mixed up. But then he's also young, which is which made mm-hmm. me feel a lot better because, because, of course, he's thinking the same thing or he's feeling the same way, uh, which is obvious. <laughs> okay, so let, let me let me go back to what Sharon said in the chat. I'm like, Charlie was six when the apocalypse happened, right? Because when she was found Read by that last Mel- one without reading, <laughs> I don't want it. Mel, Mel and Dennis, <laughs> when, when she was found by Mel and Dennis, ah. quote unquote, hey, I'm going to be 14 in a week. Problem solved <laughs> instead of 13. Yeah, if she would have been a little older, maybe it would have been less cringy. But I don't know. I still it's still kids. Right. But to Sharon D's point, I mean, it's not like they have a wide pool to choose from. To your point. Yeah, not a lot. Of, but lo and behold, with a narrow pool of one, it happened to work in there. Like they're just, imagine having not had to having to think about coupling up in the apocalypse ever. First of all, because of your age. Second of all, because of the apocalypse. And then coming along it somebody. It doesn't that, mean you have to jump into a relationship in the space of one day. I don't think they had control over it, to be perfectly honest. Did, did you when you were younger? I didn't as much. I mean, you try, like but your then, feelings. Yeah, you, you don't mean, want. Or, um, I I remember feeling you like just, you know, just like you don't just like meet someone for the first time and like a day later you're like, yeah, uh, <laughs> we're together yeah. now. I'm gonna turn my mic. Well, off. we gotta. Well, we gotta. We gotta remember. We've said n- multiple times now that time frames in the apocalypse are different. Like when you're with someone for a month, that's like basically 10 years together, so, right? Which is the Sharon. You don't know what day. Too. Yeah. And even Charlie says like, what if I don't make it back to, for you to teach me how to bowl? Like this might be all we have. I might not make it back. So you have to teach me to bowl right now. Hmm. Should they be 
taking advantage of every moment? Should she be jumping in with both feet? Because Sh- should she even knows? be thinking about her well, mortality? Imagine that. Right. Because who thinks who the about the mortality we'll at 13? Tomorrow? Yeah. Well, kids in the apocalypse do. <laughs> but how jarring is that? This is, yeah. way, this is something that we it said. shouldn't have to. Is that right. that's this is something, mean, right? This is something yeah. we said about the kids in the Walking Dead World Beyond before the show even came on. What is it like to, to grow up feeling like you need to push the next generation forward? They need, they need to have that awkward phase where they're like, does she like me? Does he like me? You know? <laughs> to, to whom? That's the problem. Nobody to talk to to settle these feelings or to at least normalize them. So it's 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 going all over the place. This is all chemical to let's give the devil his her their due, which is could they have made it m- more apparent that there was a lack of control or that there was a lack of dialing back some of their feelings? I mean, Ali tries to he's obviously a little older. He tries to dial back his feelings and we should go, et cetera, et cetera, you know, whatever. But c- could could it have been more apparent that there was a little lack of or hesitation when it came to feelings? And maybe. But I mean, the way it shook out, I think was kind of not perfect, but I, th- I thought it was adequate. I mean, mm. her saying the things like you said that broke your brain, she probably shouldn't have said to Ali says mm-hmm. a lot already about her feelings. Mm-hmm. So. To be fair, I don't question it that hard. I just didn't enjoy watching it. Yeah, you're weird. <laughs> it doesn't, make, <laughs> doesn't make sense. Do you- it's, it's like part of the reason I don't watch like like watching World Beyond. Like they're just dumb kids. Like it's not interesting. <laughs> Maybe when I was your age, I probably felt the same way. Like, I want to get away from being a kid as fast as humanly possible. I'm not a kid. <laughs> no, you're in your, you're almost 20, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I felt that way almost like immediately. Like when I started hitting 20, I was like, I want to be disassociated with youth. ASAP. PLS. Now. <laughs> there's, there's other shows that are youth orientated that I really enjoy. It's just when they make them like dumb and stupid kids. It's like. Not interesting. But we're all we were all dumb and stupid kids. And I think maybe that's why I'm, I'm and this is what I'm gonna attribute to is like is But in like, the apocalypse, stupid gets you killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As evidenced. But you mm-hmm. know, but, but there's also that other side of the, the equation, like, you know, do we live to survive or do we live to thrive? And so sometimes and I look, I'm not saying this is something we should agree or disagree with, but like, you know, there's a there's an argument there at least to say, is life worth living it and maybe because it kind of hits on June a little bit, is life worth living if we're just living to survive? And mm. to Charlie's kind of point, she was saying, like, I'm reaching 13 because the emergency system occasionally shows the date. And like, I'm turning 13 and I'm realizing a nuclear bomb went off. <laughs> and 13 is the year of bar mitzvah, let's say, and becoming an adult. I think what she was trying to express, though, by saying it in that way is that, like, I had not realized how much time had passed. I didn't realize I was turning 13. And then all of a sudden it came rushing in. Like, first of all, a bomb went off, a nuclear bomb went off. All my friends, all the people that had taken care of me, most of them had died. John died. I could well die. And I'm literally a kid just figuring out I haven't done anything kids do, really. I've read children's books that I threw away because Luciana's trying to be nice. <laughs> and then and and Scrabble games that John made up on the way. And everybody's trying to tell me to be a kid when I just didn't want to be anymore. And like to Sharon's point, she's never had a friend her age. We keep them, they have hormones. <laughs> They're teenagers. She's lonely. Thus expressing that I think she like she kind of liked this episode. And not only for the June thing. She's really, she's really coming to grow to love Charlie. Okay, but if you don't survive, there's no way to have a better future. There's no way to make it happen. But yeah, to, to your point, like, okay, but that's not the only factor. Like, you, yeah, you survive to go on another day, but what's survival worth with Morgan or with Victor or with whomever if you, you don't get to do the things kids do? And I'm going to be an adult soon. And I haven't done all the kid things like you people did, apparently. Like, what does she think kid things are? Like bowling. Things that she's read about, clearly. Like bowling. Like the little prince. Yeah. And probably, yeah, and probably, like, what is bowling? What is it? I've seen it on in books, in picture books, probably too. Like, I don't know what it mm-hmm. is. I don't know how to do it. Seems like fun. Uh, Sharon D says Ali's two years older. How much? How much more could he have done? Uh, but he, his father, basically lived in the bowling alley. So, like, uh, obviously he was there cheering him on and, and stuff like that. Ali, Muhammad Ali, the photo of them together. So, yeah, that that happened. Yeah, at least so he knows a little bowl. bit more. We can He's say that much more sure. cognizant. I suppose. And the two year difference when you're a child is big. It is. I remember being 13 and thinking a 15 year old was like, oh, they're so old. Teach me all your ways. 
<laughs> well, my sister's two years younger than me, and I've like never considered us close in age mm-hmm. until. Yeah, like, and the opposite. Now. When I was fifteen, I remember looking at thirteen-year-olds thinking they were babies, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's put it that way. Well, and the, like you're the difference between seventh yeah. and fifth grade, elementary Ooh. versus junior high. So, yeah, huge. Absolutely. You're in junior high school so those, slash middle that school. Age specifically, I think can. I mean, even though it is only two years maturity wise, it's it is a big gap. I think, but yeah, but we're but we're talking about the apocalypse. Like these aren't kids growing up in normal times. So I don't know. Maybe that gap is a lot smaller since they're all kind of on a more level playing field in the apocalypse. And after the bomb went off. I mean, even more so now. It's emblematic that she mm-hmm. can't even remember how what her parents even looked like at first, too, when Alicia has her moment with her in Close Your Eyes. So it's like, you know, I've been out here so long, yay long, that I can't even remember that. And then now you're going to expect me to remember what bowling is or what that might, might have been like or this image I have of it. So like, and then so Ali has that two-year jump where like, okay, I can remember also what my father looks helps. like because he was with me. And yeah, the picture <laughs> always helps because I keep, keep coming back here. <laughs> so. Poor Charlie, out out there all alone by herself. She she see that's the that's the other thing too. Like Ali had his father up to a point until the bomb went off. I, I feel in some senses worse for him. Like obviously I feel bad for Charlie, right? She's all alone, right? Until Mel and Ennis came along. But like having your father and then losing him, and then and then deciding like okay, I don't want to see him go through this. He was a strong man. He was he was in he was in the mil- he was a ranger, like one of the more highly regarded people in the army. He, they're right under like the the green berets, you know. So it's kind of like, how do you see uh, and an imam, right? And a, a religious uh, a, a cleric in the army, or a uh, sorry, a chaplain. It just for my thing, like whenever I'd see my father cry, I just it would knee jerk, I would cry too. So it's like, how do you watch somebody that you view as strong and protective, and and this this paragon of who I'm supposed to be wither? I I get I get what he what he felt, and again, teenager, whatever, too. So, like, how do you expect a kid to kind of handle all those emotions, too? I mean, of course, we can all judge, sit in judgment, but, like, I get it. I get what he's going through. And he wants to make it up with him now, to him now that he's a little older, let's say. Because, again, we're talking about several months since the bombs went off, too. And an accelerated apocalypse. What do you do with your time and all that time? Sit and stew. So, just like you said before about Victor, what is Victor looking for? There's a point at which when the, when the stalkers come to the bowling alley... One of them actually says, is there anyone in there? Hello, is there anyone in there? But at the end of it, as they're walking away, and it's very faint, but it's in the subtitles, it says, there's only about three over here. There's really nothing. Now, what, what do you think they're looking for at this point? Arno and the stalkers. There's only three over there. There's really nothing. Could they just be referring to three walkers? Yeah, I think so, too. Could it too. just be that simple? Could it be just the continuation of the last episode where they're just throwing all these walkers into the pit or collecting all the really bad ones into the pit? So what is their end game? Are they going to weaponize a bunch of these walkers to hit Strand's tower? To what end, though? He already has walkers surrounding the tower. So what are what are a few more going to do? Well, but like the walkers around the tower, no, they're not half as irradiated or even at all irradiated, maybe, let's say, than the ones that Arno threw at them earlier. Yeah, they... With- he with already the dirty launched bombs. some. At, yeah, he already launched some. So what's the next step? We can safely assume that Grace got all of them. The ones that aren't originally placed. This has been such a long time. But what if there was a walker that you couldn't even get near? And these are these are they, the crater walkers, the impact crater walkers, let's say. Mm. Okay, so there's that. But then I was thinking something else. Throughout the last two episodes, I've been thinking this one, one, one thing in my mind. And that's a Twilight Zone episode called The Shelter, which we've actually brought up on the show quite a few times. And and the essential basic premise of that episode, and this is something that's been wearing on me, is if you didn't take the time to prepare, the hysteria of people makes it so that if I can't be in it, nobody can. And that's like, that seems to me like Arno. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's not that I want to live there. It's just that I just want to, I just want to watch the world burn. I want to watch the rest of the world burn or the rest of our area burn too. And, and some of it, hmm. some of that makes me think Alicia is thinking the same thing. I just have a feeling that like, based on the Beethoven reference, like that maybe she'll get the idea that peace among all peoples will maybe rule the day. But Arno won't think that. Arno is well past that. Arno's all about revenge. All, Arno, Arno's all about revenge without reason. Revenge on Alicia? Revenge on the world, let's say. 
He's just mad at everybody. Yeah, mad at the world. Or maybe he's like stuck on like justice. Like, okay, Alicia, fuck you because you killed all our people. I believed in you. Like Teddy wanted me to. Or fuck you, Victor. You have the means to save everybody, but you are focusing on the few that you deem worthy. Fuck you. That's what Teddy did, though. What was? Do you think we're going to see what happened in the bunker? Arno blames Alicia for getting everyone killed. Alicia kind of blames herself, too. But we don't actually know what happened, do we? I think we saw enough, maybe. Is it not just that they all left the bunker to find Padre and follow this walker around? Probably. But I think there was okay, more so just to by, it. just by Alicia convincing everyone to leave the bunker, that got them killed. Yeah, yeah, at least for the most part. But there is something else that we got to see in the first episode, and that's we'll go back to the bunker. And what we saw left of the bunker was kind of destroyed. So what Alicia does say in the last episode kind of makes sense. Then what was that, though? Could that have mm -hmm. been like maybe that last round of salvos maybe from the sub that happened to have hit the... Well, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. What, okay, let me go through the events of just the the that last episode slash first episode of the season. We get to see the the bunker shake initially when Alicia's looking out into the hallway. But then mm. it shakes again when she's craw crawling through the sewer, whatever it was, following the senator. So it happened again. So maybe in that moment, because they already had the confrontation between one of the members and feet almost feeding will to the walker and alicia says stop and then he stops and then etc and then they go off to the side and they have this plan and then while they're doing the plan that's a second battery of nukes or something like that so maybe something hit really close to the bunker and the structure integrity of the bunker failed them and so they felt like they had to go out into the world and be be padre <laughs> or like look for look for padre or tell people that there is a padre out there so maybe we solved it because we saw the effects of the bunker, essentially, in that Will episode. Well, Sharon D is reminding me also, Arno said that she got everyone killed because she said she knew where to go. And we, we have heard Alicia say that, too. I think she was talking to Morgan, right? Yeah. And she's like, I basically lied and said I knew where I was going, but I didn't. I was just or like based on a dream. I'd find it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I made all these choices based on a dream. Right. Which, yeah, that that is a that is a bad decision. That's that's a Madison decision right there. Like, <laughs> learn learn from your mom. She sucks. Yeah. Don't yeah. do what Madison does. So there's another thing that I wanted to touch on as well. Why does Victor keep sending people to the pit? Because we see Garcia gets thrown into the pit. What purpose does that serve? Just adding more to their ranks? Because somebody else points it out. And I can't remember who. Oh, yes. One of the stalkers that corners Ali. The female. Yeah. Yeah. She says, why does Victor keep throwing people into the pit? She, she's even wondering why. Does she say sending them to the pit or throwing them in the pit? I think dialogue's important here because it did confuse me the way she phrased it. I wrote it down exactly. She says, why does he keep sending people to the pit? Okay. So when she said that initially, I didn't think about the moat, the walker moat as a uh, pit. I was okay. thinking of like a literal pit. Wait a minute. Hold on a like second. Like the crater? Yeah. I was thinking the moat. Yeah. But no. Yeah. I was thinking oh, the crater. Interesting. So it's not Arno and the stalkers. It's Victor. And maybe that's why he's scouting ahead. Well, maybe we figured that out. Mm. Sharon, said the same thing. The pit is the crater at the end. So yeah, that's, my brain that's what was, I was okay. So my brain heard pit and I was thinking the moat because we kept seeing people fly mm -hmm. from the, the windows like to the moat. Right. But but how would she know that? Like, unless they're standing there just staring at the tower, how does she know Victor's Which, doing that? Well, that makes sense to me, though. Like, she's standing there looking out at the tower trying to get <laughs> into, right? That That's where my brain connected that dot. Okay. It didn't connect that. my Because I saw Arno at the, at the pit, the impact crater. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, I didn't call it, that's way bigger than a pit. Okay. An impact crater that, that is the size of like, <laughs> I don't know, 20 football fields, let's say. Let's say, which is 20,000 square miles. It's, it's, sorry. 20, who cares? Metric system. I don't know. It's really big. It's very big. Let's just go with it's really big. the size big. of a small town. <laughs> so, it's very big. Yeah. Um, what population so, yeah. is the town? Uh, is 20,000 <laughs> uh, uh, wa yeah. walkers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so when she, yeah, the fact that she said, why does he keep sending people to the pit? That's what made my, my brain juices flow. Well then, okay. So we saw, I guess we solved where Victor is scouting now. It's that makes logical sense to me now. 
And now that I've, we've connected that dot, we know that the Stalkers are concerned about this too. We see Arno visit the pit, even with his hand that might have to get cut off because, or he might die or, so, <laughs> or at least be operated on. So then they're concerned about the pit too, uh, that Victor is apparently sending them to. So then what, so then that goes back to the question of the Stalkers. We, there's only three, they need more, more what? Walkers, more what? I'm not sure. Mm. Or maybe they're trying to do the same play again. They're just trying to stuff irradiated material into the bellies again to launch them. Or It's interesting to think of. Because now we know what Victor is doing, now, but now we don't know what the stalkers are doing now. Unless they're doing the same thing. <laughs> maybe they're all sending th walkers to the maybe pit. They're, may, yeah, maybe they're after the same thing to fight the other one. Right? Kind of like what you said. Like if they're trying to accumulate extra dangerous walkers, maybe they're both trying to get the same thing to attack the other one. So what you're saying is, it's like the Cold War. Like, okay, we're both stockpiling nuclear weapons and talking trash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, whoever has the most wins, but so then, okay, then it goes back to Beethoven. The only, the only Beethoven? way that, well, yes, the beef, <laughs> the beef oven. The only way this ends is peace between all peoples, because mm -hmm. that's how mm -hmm. it ultimately, I know that history hasn't written the whole story, but as thus far, that's how it ended. That's how the Cold War ended. Everybody had nukes. Everybody was pointing at them at point, threatening to point them at each at each other. And at the end of the day, knowing that it would annihilate the planet and the world, the world as it we know it, we said enough is enough. We need to figure this out. Is, is, mm -hmm. Okay, so wait, there's a bigger question than that. Maybe Jasmine can answer first. Do you think that will happen? Knowing this show, that peace can be achieved between all peoples. Um, maybe not all peoples. Maybe some people will have to go, like Arno and, and crew, maybe? I don't know, yeah. but they're the ones with the other side of the nukes. I'm not sure, really. I feel like I feel like Arno's gonna die. Like, just inevitable. Well, that's funny. Okay, and by the way, if you think about it, Morgan Sub still has nukes, I think, too. So is Morgan, mm -hmm. like, the America in this situation, keeping both parties in check? <laughs> it's like, it's essentially, essentially. Isn't Morgan at war with Strong, though, technically? True, but if... But let's think about well, Morgan for... Right, but let's think about Morgan for a moment. If he had the option to make peace and not kill innocent people, let's say, then wouldn't he be that check against total annihilation, let's say? Yeah. Of, of all the people on the show, maybe June, definitely. But, like, she doesn't have that capability. She's not in immediate contact <laughs> with nuclear material. So, well, what do you think, Rach? Do you think that's even possible? Do you think that's a possibility for the show? No, absolutely peace, not. Peace That'd be a very boring peoples. show to watch. So someone's <laughs> going to fuck shit up just like they did in, at yeah. the end of the last season. Okay. Yeah. I, I think they may try to attempt peace, right? Right. That, that's where they're going to angle it. And then some, you know, somebody will fuck it up. Probably right. Morgan. Or try to. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, ho, hey, ho, ho. If you like what you heard. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but if you didn't like what you heard, send all <laughs> mail to Cosmo on zero nine. <laughs> you said the thing that I wanted. Shut up, you. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. No, really, you'll get like praise mail. Be like, oh, yeah, finally, someone said it. Morgan right? Jones is the worst. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, they're going to probably angle him to be the, or probably Alicia. They'll probably angle Alicia to be the one who achieves peace between all peoples. Given that she had the Paul know. episode. Yeah, probably. I'm not saying making, staking a claim here. I feel like mm. I'm, I'm picking up on the breadcrumbs, like the Ode to Joy and all that stuff. I'm like, oh, it's not going to go sideways this time. I don't know. I'm naive. <laughs> I'll admit it. Whatever. Would you say that Ali became the butterfly in a sense? He became the thing that he was supposed to. Uh, by originally. that you mean he got squashed? <laughs> yeah, I'm with but Jasmine. Unfortunately, <laughs> right? I mean, he's not a morning cloak. Did he become the evolved self? Let's say, did he move beyond what his own expectations of what he could be could be? Fortunately, or not? Mm, yeah, I guess. I'm gonna go with no. Oh, okay. Why do you say that? I'm curious. I didn't see any evolution in the character. Hmm. I mean, he. He was the same person at the beginning that he was at the end. He just met a girl in between. <laughs> huh. What do you say, Jasmine? What Rachel said. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to be the one? Fuck, man. I, I feel, okay, I feel, I do feel like he moved past his own, what he, what he thought was his dream into something Being else. Being a ranger? Yeah, ex exactly. What he, what he even he conceived. He gave up his dream to be with a girl. <laughs> I, well, more than, that's, more than that. That's to, to, to be a hero. I mean, it's one thing to be a thing. Her hero. Yeah, well, maybe that's, a, I don't know, maybe that's even better. Because they both... Because in this it's definitely not the tower's hero. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But maybe that's enough. To he be tried. Charlie's hero? Yeah. 
Why not? Well, that's and like, I mean, that's could, like the highest have... praise you can give a dying person too. Is just make them feel happy. Maybe in a short amount of time, he realized that Charlie Good, Howard Bad. <laughs> uh, and you know what? We also discussed something uh, when it came to Carol, just seeking vengeance for the people who have died and the possibility of sacrificing the people who are still alive. So when I say he's evolving, I say he's trying to just be a ranger for the sake of having abandoned his father. But here's a living person you can enable, let's say, until he finds out that she's sick and dying. But like, here's a person that you can live for or that you can live through, let's say. Why spend your time on people who have passed or why waste, no, I'm not going to say waste, but like why exert all that energy, uh, energy on people who have died when you can spend it helping someone live. And I think that's an evolved sense of purpose and moving past like what your own expectations are. Oh, I was supposed to be a ranger, but I became something better, like mm. more actualized, more full. Cause just being a ranger for the sake of fulfilling your, you know, some sort of replacement for having abandoned your father just seems not hollow, but like just the thing. Oh, I'm just supposed to be this thing. I'm supposed to be a butterfly. But then it, I, like, I had this like weird, weird thought. Like I remember when he was, when Ollie was holding Charlie from behind and asking her what's wrong, et cetera. And like something popped into my head. What, like what makes what Ali is doing any different than what Victor is doing? I'm trying to remember exactly where my mindset was though. So Strand is holding these butterflies in captivity, let's say. He's, he's admiring or giving these butterflies a chance to thrive, but in his tower in captivity. In his own way, knowing that Charlie has a limited lifespan, he is helping her live, but in captivity. And I, I wrote this down. I don't know if this makes any sense. And I don't know what I was thinking at the time, but like maybe Victor in his own way wants to watch these butterflies live, but in captivity. He, he's trying hmm. to almost recreate life or like allow people to thrive, but in his tower, in, in a sense. I don't, I don't know that I would agree that Ali is allowing Charlie to thrive in captivity because he goes so far as to try and enact Morgan's plan, which you know, means them coming in, them attacking. So essentially, I mean, the end goal would be out of captivity, right? right or right. a different kind of captivity? I don't know. Keep in mind, I, I wrote this just before. <laughs> it says, Ali tries to shut off the beacon. Oh, okay. You know, I watched the episode. <laughs> I'm watching, I'm just taking notes again, but like, it's like up until that point, it was like, okay, Charlie is the butterfly in captivity, just like Victor was trying to do, like in his, in his, in his own sense, mm -hmm. let's say. Different intention, but, you know, I want these things to thrive, but in the tower, in captivity. They can thrive how I say they can thrive. Right. He's making it so that this is the only way. Like, this is the only way we get back to living in here. Like who? Like Teddy, all this time. Because mm. <laughs> I, as I was doing this episode, I was like, we made so many comparisons from Victor to Ginny, let's say. We compared Victor to Ginny with the Rangers and all that stuff and him trying to recreate things, him dressing a different way, like almost like a African warlord some in some places. But then we hadn't thought that like maybe everything that he was doing, Ali saying to, to Charlie as he's taking her to, to whatever pen they have or jail they have, he called, he called it the holding. Mm. Victor's borrowing from a variety of playbooks here that like I hadn't, I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me that he was, might be taking a little culty um, license from Teddy. I usually have a sense of dread when I truly believe someone's in danger and i don't feel like that about charlie do you guys really think we're gonna lose her at some point <sighs> it's not it's not hasn't sunk in i'll say that yeah at, least. at the very least at the very least but i i am feeling what you're feeling like it, it can't like it can't be over for her right like it that's, can't that's, yeah right. like it just yeah no way it just I don't wanna, can't be the end i don't want to be this sad and then, a, like, and then to your think, mind rejects it Right, because then we have to think about, like, watching Charlie suffer through the effects of the radiation. Like, that's even worse. Like, watching her slowly die painfully. No, thank you. So someone come and wave your magic wand, cast a spell, and fix Charlie, please. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and because, okay, and there's there's a, a narrative danger to this, too. I mean, not with the anthology-style episodes. You get to break away from that situation and not have to constantly watch it, like we did Carl. Because mm -hmm. there was, for me, and I know for a lot of people, it it, it dragged. And it was not, like, it's, it's sad. Let's, let me just say that out front. Like you said in the last episode, I like Alicia. I like Carl. Right. <laughs> but story-wise, it was, it was, it was dragging a little long. Like, I know it was an homage to, to the character, but the, it did the whole two episodes 
it was pain, it was painful, but to the point where you your mind kind of shuts off a little bit. Obviously, you love the character, but like this this is too much. So like when I look at Charlie, I feel like that could be the same. But since the anthology, we get to move to a whole other place with the dread in their in our background minds. She's she's not good. She's not gonna really. She might die. Oh no. And she, you're not seeing her on screen dying, but in the back of your mind, you're playing that film, and now you're you're adjusting to the fact she might die. And and it, she is dying. And it's. <laughs> and it's not looking good either because we already see like the effects on her skin. It's fast. Um, oh my god! It, I don't like this. Let's just remind the audience: you were not always you're you were no. never a Charlie fan. Not really. Up until recently, I was not a Charlie fan. No. Mm-mm. And now you're. It being took a f- long time for me to rationalize her being a child and and acting in a childlike way. And we have proof. I, because I do, I did love Nick. Like Nick in the beginning, next to Alicia, was one of my favorite characters. And so, yeah, when that happened, I was really, I was really mad. It was yeah. very much how I still feel about Negan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> still, still, so, still, yeah, yeah. Oh, pretty always, much, pretty much, always. But I've definitely come around on Charlie because, unlike Negan, she was a child, and I did have to convince myself. I had to remind myself of that. She was a kid, and she's still a kid. You know, she's still a kid. And you know She's me. Still very much you know kid. me with children. Eat them. I mean, aside save them. from <laughs> when they're young enough, e- eat them. <laughs> but like when you when you find and I was thinking about this when I was watching the first time. I'm like, obviously I like Charlie, but like I'm th- I was thinking back like how I was trying to rationalize Dakota, right? And trying mm. to rationalize it's despite no, fuck Dakota, right? Well, like well enough about you. <laughs> Let's talk more about me. No, <laughs> but like even me trying to like make sense of her character and what she ends up doing and then feeling really in even charity i did not expect her feel it to feel like she was oh, lonely yeah in the moment you know? in that and moment that, yeah. even her admitting that got me re- like a little mo- even more <laughs> emotional than i i brought myself to right because you know me i justify some things mm-hmm. so then that now we turn that to charlie i like i was sad when nick died but i i felt for her I felt for her immediately I to feel like what that must have been like or that decision must have been like. And, and th- what burns me the most about this is like the fans that never came around to Charlie. That's what burns me. And like now I'm like, I'm going to feel all the things and there's going to be a contingent here. But like, dang dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. I, I wonder if anyone out there who still doesn't like Charlie, they might have a moment like I did with Gabe, right? Like, I don't like this character, but do I really want them to die? Like, do I am I ready for? for this character not to be here anymore. Like that's like my reaction about Daryl Dixon in season 10. I'm like, Whoa, I didn't really like him per se, but, but like, he's getting the shit to kicked out of him. And I don't like it. I don't like yeah. it at all. Yeah. Like yeah. all of a sudden you realize maybe I like this character more than I, I thought, thought I, I did. did. Yeah. <laughs> now the film is playing in the back of my mind. And now I know we're not going to cut. I don't know. Well, no, 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 I do know. The next episode is going to be with Daniel Salazar, Luciana Lucy. and Wes mm-hmm. and some of the stalkers. So we are cutting away. So that film is going to be playing in the back of my mind about Charlie and how she's coping. How she's doing. And mm-hmm. then and then trying to picture in my brain how she's going to look like in that next episode, knowing that there's going to be time skips. Mm. I, I, and I'm, I'm going to say this out loud. I know they're not going to do this, but there's a little thing in the back of my head that says, given the fact that there are time skips, are they going to like bury her off screen? No, nah, mm. they wouldn't do that. I say that, right? They would. They wouldn't do that. But then there's that like little panic in the back of my head like please don't do that please please don't do that like it's irrational but please please don't bury charlie off screen i really liked her i mean she's a character that would definitely emotionally impact a lot of people i think i mean even if you're not a big fan of charlie in the story well not only in the story but i think you know in the fans like Uh. i said like even if you're not a huge charlie fan like She's still a kid. Like, she's a kid, child. Like, what kind of monster is okay just watching a kid die off, on a, even on a show? Monsters. The internet monsters, is all full of, of monsters. Yes, right. I loved watching <laughs> Dakota die. Yes, I enjoyed it very much. I was sad. I was sad. <laughs> and even Sharon was sort of sad. Well, no, wanna... you weren't sad about her dying. You were sad about her being alone, right? Right. Is that the clarification? Sharon no, 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 you. I mean, you. Oh, I me? know Sharon D's glad. Yeah, I, no, I know Sharon D's glad she's dead, but I was she was sad, sad about the loneliness. Because. Yeah. Well, to use Sharon D's framing, because she was alone in this world. I I, I kind of like. Oh, in uh, the world, not in the moment. Oh, okay. No, in, in the world, but then in the moment. The, but the fact that she made her decision 
to say, fuck this, fuck that. I know what I did. I'm going to go out my way. I kind of admired Mm -hmm. that little bit of it. Like that she took her licks and she said, I'm going to take my punishment now. It's it, I'm in control of how I go. Yeah, it was I, I, her choice. So. Right, right. She made the right choice for, for most people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you like what you heard, head over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash walking dead and give us five stars and an F1 or whatever fe- rating you feel is appropriate. Just let us know after every single cut out episode, go and rate on your relevant rating service platform whatever you like to listen to us on and um if you really really love what we're doing head over to ko-fi.com forward slash squawking dead where you don't even have to give us a coffee or join a membership tier for as little as a dollar a month where you get to do all the awesome shit that people do (laughs) you can simply just Follow us, and then when you see something you like, you can jump in and buy us a coffee and get 30 days access to support of our content, and you can do the behind the scenes stuff and join us in episodes like Sharon D and maybe Bridget did, I don't know, or, <laughs> or you can even join, join us at Survivors here where there is limited places left, there's like two places left, and you can join us on the stream and help us break down the episodes. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. I've been your host, David Cario, and I've been joined by <laughs> Jasmine, aka Jasmine.iac, and every now and again when internet allowed, Rachel, aka Cosmobob09. See you next time. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.